welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. Uh, if you tuned in last week, we talked about different types of garments that women might have worn in the 19th century. Uh, this week we're going to dig a little bit deeper into the production of cloth and clothing. So we're going to dig into the labor that went into making all those beautiful clothes possible. And um, so when I give you a warning, um, it's, it's not always a nice story. Uh, the textile industry essentially profited on the exploitation of low or unpaid labor. Um, and it's important to realize that behind the pretty clothes, um, there were people working very hard for little to no pay. We're gonna start with a um, couple of fabrics uh, that we're going to sort of zip by pretty quickly because uh, most of our textile production is going to talk about linen and cotton. I do want to touch very briefly on wool and silk, however. Uh, wool and silk are our protein fibers, which means they are made from animal products. And when we think about cast, we think about them as being fairly provincial with closed systems and people working on um, subsistence farms where they grew and made everything that they used. And actually, um, this is kind of a misconception because going back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, there has always been a very global network of trade of goods moving across the world. Um, and it's no different from textile products. So wool here is something that um, has been in use you know, for millennia. And it really got started as a um, global trade in the 16 and 1700s, and this happened in England, which was um, about 100 to 150 years ahead of the United States in terms of the Industrial Revolution. So by the 1700s, um, British had established textile factories that had essentially dominated the global trade of wool. And these factories were so efficient that wool was being produced in all kinds of grades and all kinds of qualities at prices in England that made it um, the, the most efficient to purchase it other places. So if you were an American colonist living in 1780 in Boston, say, you would most likely be importing your cloth from Britain. Um, Actually, no, 1780, you're in the middle of the Revolutionary War, so you wouldn't have wanted anything British. Let's say 1760, and then again in 1880 or 1800. But uh, point being that the urban American colonists were very dependent on uh, British wool for import. And again, this was being produced in such quantities that it was fairly inexpensive to buy, even considering it had to come across the ocean. Um, if you were living in rural areas, you might very well be raising your own sheep. Um, the trouble with American sheep were that they weren't super hardy and they didn't have the nice quality of wool um, that British sheep had until about the mid-19th century. So it was a long time before the American wool industry took off. And we've got this wonderful tube here that kind of shows the different grades of wool we've got raw wool that's been washed, um, wool that's been carded, um, spun into yarn and wool fabric here. And the American wool industry finally took off during the Civil War. And this was in large part because um, with the blockades of Southern cotton, um, the American Union Army had to look elsewhere for um, textiles and Americans in general. And so this really ramped up the uh, wool production and that machinery, the, the wool textile industry was kind of in place and chugging along after the Civil War. Um, so again, if you were um, on a farm and living in a rural area in America, you might well be making your own wool. Um, if you were in an urban center, probably you were buying it from England. Silk is a fabric that for a very long time um, was considered a luxury import. Now silk has been manufactured in China since um, approximately 4000 BC. There is a uh, creation myth surrounding silk that um, says that the Chinese empress uh, Zhi Ling Shi was walking in her garden under a mulberry tree when a cocoon from a silkworm fell into her cup of hot tea and then started to unravel. 
and she was fascinated by all the fibers in this uh, silkworm cocoon and had it unraveled and discovered that um, with production, this could create a fabric that was very soft and very strong and luxurious. Um, we don't know if that's actually what happened, but um, we do know that China had been producing silk um, for many millennia, and China had guarded the secrets to silk production very closely, also for hundreds and hundreds of years. It wasn't until the uh, Crusades of the Middle Ages, around the 1100s, that the secret of making silk made its way from the Far East and Middle East to European countries. Um, by the 1700s, France was a major producer of silk. Um, Britain had its own silk industry. But again, silk did not take off in America until after the Civil War. So early Americans would have been importing their silk products. So here we have um, an example of silk in its layers of production. So this is a, a silkworm cocoon. So this is a you know tightly wound ball of fibers, and the labor involved in unraveling those super fine fibers is, is kind of beyond me. Here's a degummed cocoon. So it's been um, soaked and is in the process of coming apart. And here are the fibers when they're all unraveled and um, put into a, a skein here. And I wish that you could touch it through the screen because it's so soft and silky and smooth and just a lovely feeling. It truly is a luxury fabric. And then, of course, woven into silk fabric. But we're kind of going to skip on um, past these because they didn't figure hugely into early American textile production. They were, as we said, import products. Um, we're going to touch briefly on cotton now, but we will come back to cotton. Suffice to say that until 1793, um, cotton was a bit of a non-starter in terms of being a plant that could also be a commodity because of these fine seeds in it. This is a um, cotton bowl, and the seeds in it uh, were very labor intensive to remove. So you could grow acres and acres of cotton, but the bottleneck happened when all these seeds had to be picked out by hand and that just slowed production to the point where it wasn't super profitable um, to produce cotton. So we'll put a pin in that and come back to that in a little bit. This meant that in early America, linen was um, basically your go-to fabric for home production. Now, this isn't to say that linen wasn't being produced in Great Britain, because it certainly was. Um, for a while, it had been Dutch linen that was kind of the gold standard. In fact, there's still a um, quality of linen called Holland linen that reflects this. Um, but the British kind of came to prominence in the 1700s. So again, if you are in an urban area, probably you are importing your linen from England. Um, also, if you want really nice linen, you're importing it from Great Britain because they are able to create a very fine quality that homespun just isn't able to achieve. Um, the linen plant was very inexpensive in terms of money to produce, but it was very labor intensive to produce. So um, you would start about a year out um, and you would plant your linen in the, or I'm sorry, your flax in the spring. And by summer, it was ready to harvest. So this is a flax plant. It's got these kind of woody stalks and these seeds on it. The um, flax would be harvested by pulling it out of the ground. You're beginning to heard the song, uh, Bringing in the Sheaves, the old um, religious song. Uh, this is why pulling sheaves. And then they need to sit and dry out in the field for a while. After they've dried out, uh, they undergo a process called redding, in which they're soaked to kind of um, soften up that outer woody stalk. And then they're processed using the following tools. So if you want to follow me, this is the flax breaker. So you would uh, lift this handle here, put your stalks of flax in it, and you would break it. And you're literally breaking that woody stalk to um, get to the soft fibers underneath. Um, before that happened, I'm sorry, skip the step of the rippling. That comb looking thing is a ripple or a flax comb. And this would be drawn through the stalks of uh, flax to pull off the seeds. And the seeds um, could be used to uh, create um, like flax seed oil or they could be saved over for the next year's planting. So after you've broken the flax in the flax break, then it goes through these two torture looking devices called hackles. 
the wide hackle, you would draw the flax through and kind of further smooth it out. And then you would run it through a fine hackle. And then finally, you have a fiber that is soft enough to spin into yarn. And at that point, you would use a flax wheel. And there's an example behind this here. Now, a flax wheel um, tends to be smaller than the great wheels that were used for um, spinning yarn. So a lady would be seated here and do her spinning. Um, there is some terminology that comes to us from the production of flax. Um, if you've heard of the distaff side of the family, this is the distaff. It's the place where the um, flax would sit as it's getting ready to be spun. It's on the left hand. Um, so, um, and it was, uh, spinning flax was considered a, a woman's job. And so if you're from the distaff side of the family, you're on the, the female side, basically through your mother's line. Um, and then uh, if you've heard of a toe head, a blonde child, toe is the, the kind of very whitish blondish remnants of flax that are left behind. And I guess that's Yes. Will the flax socks place in the breaker parallel or perpendicular to the length of the breaker? Great question. So uh, the question is, were the flax stocks placed in it um, parallel to the breaker or perpendicular? And the answer is perpendicular. And we actually have a video of a demonstration of flax making, and you'll get it in your follow-up email uh, tomorrow. But uh, you can see one of these things in action. So essentially, you would lift the handle with your right hand, you'd have the stock in your left hand, and you'd put it down and go mash, 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 mash. So each handful of it, you kind of like break it along the length, um, drawing it perpendicularly through. And then after you had spun your linen, um, then it would go on this yarn winder. And these things would rotate around. It's a way to keep all your linen together so it doesn't get all knotted up. And these cover devices can also kind of uh, count your lengths. Um, I'm not sure the mechanics of it, but I do know that it will kind of click and um, you can keep track of exactly how much you're producing on this. And so your final product um, is homespun linen. And this is an example of a Lindsay woven dress. And it's actually mixed with cotton, so it's not a purely homespun dress. But um, it is a fairly coarse fabric. Um, it feels a little bit, uh, I would say, like two grades softer than a burlap sack. But it kind of feels like if anyone's ever gotten a um, hand-knit, very scratchy wool sweater as a child and remembers that feeling. Um, it's not super soft. It's very durable. Uh, this one is actually dyed by hand as well. So when you're hand dyeing uh, fabric on your own farm, you don't have a huge variety of colors and patterns available. So um, this was kind of, you know, a, a skillful job and, and something nice that you could expect to turn out. But uh, beginning in the um, early 19th century and um, definitely in full force by around the time of the Civil War, people were moving away from this homespun linen, even in rural areas, to factory produced cotton. And so this is a cotton gown from the 1830s. And this is a roller printed. So um, the cotton factories are getting underway in the United States and um, booming in Europe um, by the early 19th century. And the the process by which you could um, print uh, patterns on the cotton was underway by the 1830s. This is called roller printing. So if you basically imagine like a paint roller that's got um, a pattern incised into it, they would roll it, you know, like roll the cloth through a machine that way. And so what you were able to achieve are um, really the sky's the limit in terms of color and pattern and it's interesting and it's vibrant and it's cheap and so if you could buy this fairly inexpensively or you could spend a year and a half raising and sewing and weaving and dyeing your own cloth um, people chose to purchase their cotton and so this um, shift happened in american textile production where this home spinning um, pretty much disappeared by the Civil War. And by the end of the 19th century, 
homespun wool or homespun linen was considered kind of this quaint old fashioned novelty um, because people had given up uh, being textile producers in favor of being consumers. So um, this dress is a great example of the consumer product, the fabric for it. The woman would have bought the dress goods as they were called and um, constructed it herself or had a dressmaker make it for it. Um, but this is the product. Let's go back to the cotton over there and talk about the production and the textile economy in the United States. Yes. How do you make dye? How do you make dye? Um, I wish my sister-in-law were here because she makes her own dyes. And um, keep in mind that um, everything here is something I know from reading in books, but I haven't actually done it myself. So I don't have the like hands-on tactile knowledge of it. But having talked to my sister-in-law and read a little bit about the subject, um, Prior to the invention of synthetic dyes in the mid to late 19th century, you would create natural dyes. And basically there are um, plants and trees that produce things that um, lend themselves to different colors. So um, my sister-in-law is always after us to pick up the walnuts from our black walnut tree in our backyard, because apparently when you boil them, they create a dye that um, is this kind of really rich buttery yellow. And so an accomplished uh, textile producer and dyer would know each of those plant products and what colors they would produce. Um, I don't know how you would get that pink or that the blue probably came from indigo. Um, but again, that's, that's one of those skills that we don't know now because we have shifted to textile producers. Yes? And I've got another question. Does the museum have any information or photographs of the textile factories that used to be in Chicago's East Ukraine? We do not. Our, um, the strength of our collection is not so much in photographs and manuscripts and more in objects, um, but I would imagine that something that um, probably the Chicago Historical Society might have. Um, and uh, textile factories by the mid 19th century were everywhere right here in Springfield. There were um, woolen factories, there was one in Decatur. So this was a, a huge part of 19th century Illinois industry that kind of fallen by the wayside. So back to cotton, where we left, last left cotton pre-1793. Um, it's not going anywhere as a commodity because it is so labor intensive to pick the seeds out of these cotton bowls. Well, 1793 is the year that a man named Eli Whitney is credited with the invention of the cotton gin. Uh, Whitney was a New Englander and he spent some time on a southern plantation and came home with an idea of how to create a machine that would de-seed the cotton. And um, scholars think that he actually probably learned of this mechanism or was inspired by the enslaved people on the plantation who would have been the ones who are actually familiar with the process of picking out cotton and probably had some ideas of innovation rather than this Yankee who was just paying a visit. But regardless, um, Whitney gets the credit and in 1793 the cotton gin is produced and gin is just short for engine. And this is a revolutionary machine um, and it's not too much of an overstatement to say that it transformed the American economy and it transformed the lives of millions and millions of people in the country. Because what it did was remove that bottleneck. So now you can grow cotton and you can de-seed it very quickly and cotton can be a commodity. And this happens to coincide at a time when um, Britain, who had been the main producer of, of cotton, um, had previously been using uh, cotton imported from India and their kind of trade relationship was faltering and they were basically looking for a new supplier. So um, now you have Americans with a supply, um, Britain with a demand, with the factories that are crying out for cotton, and you have this explosion in the American economy. And it really creates this chain reaction and a lot of things come together at once. This is a time in the uh, very early 19th century when slavery, the, the fortunes of slavery were sort of teetering. Um, slavery had been introduced and many um, enslaved people in the colonies had been involved in harvesting uh, tobacco 
and indigo. And by now, the tobacco fields of Kentucky and Virginia and North Carolina are kind of worn out, and the farmers in those areas and planters are shifting to things like wheat production that don't lend themselves as much to the use of enslaved labor. So um, there's a point where the, the demand for enslaved labor is kind of teetering, and then cotton comes on the scene, and all of a sudden it becomes very profitable um, to hire, or not hire, but to own enslaved people to pick your cotton for you. And so what happens is um, we have uh, the migration of native people out of the southeast. Um, you're familiar with the, the Trail of Tears where the um, Choctaw and Chickasaw and Cherokee people were forcibly removed from Georgia and Mississippi and Alabama and Arkansas. Um, it's not a coincidence that those lands happen to be prime cotton growing lands. So we have the uh, forced removal of native people so um, basically white men can come up and buy up their land and then we have another forced migration of enslaved people from the old slaveholding regions of Virginia, Kentucky, um, down to the cotton growing regions of the South. So if you've ever heard the expression being sold down the river, that means it refers to slaves being sold from the upper South to the lower South. And this was um, a devastating change in lifestyle. Um, it was um, never, you know, never tolerable at all to be enslaved, but the conditions on the cotton plantations were brutal to a degree that um, is unimaginable um, today and was worse um, than the tobacco growing regions. Um, slave plantations in the South growing cotton were run as giant factories and um, the enslaved people were um, basically cogs in the machine. Their value was in how much they could pick. And um, lots of people became very wealthy from this. And uh, enslaved Africans were doomed to a life of chattel slavery. And this uh, chattel slavery was literally the underpinning of the American economy. We think of it as, um, you know, a southern thing, right? The South had cotton and it was free in the North and, you know, we're on the right side of history. And in reality, the entire country was entangled in a way where everyone was sort of culpable because the southern plantations are being financed by northern banks. Um, the cotton is being shipped to England on northern ships. Um, the cotton is being processed in New England mills and consumers throughout the United States are buying cotton. So everyone is wrapped up in the system that's making money for a lot of people but is only possible because there are, um, um, by the end of slavery, four million people who are not getting paid at all and their labor is being taken from them. So this is sort of the, uh, the gritty underside to textile production. Um, the mass production of cotton will have a profound impact on American society. It leads to the rise of New England factories, which uh, provide a path to economic independence for a lot of women and children on whose labor um, they rely. On the other hand, these women and children are being employed because they can be hired at significantly lower wages than men. So um, this gives rise to the exploitation of women and child labor in New England. You see, um, as we talked about, the falling away of the home production of textiles in favor of people being consumers of cheap cotton. Um, you see fashions changing as um, cotton becomes more, less and less expensive. People can buy more and more of it. So the, the hoop skirt fashion, those fashions of the mid 19th century that rely on those yards and yards and yards of skirts, these are only possible um, because cotton is being produced cheaply. So with that, um, having discussed the production of textiles, we're going to move around the corner and switch gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about the production of clothing. So if you want to come with me. So making clothing in the 19th century, and again, one thing to keep in mind is that until the end of the 19th century, um, clothing was not made for anyone. It was made for 
somebody, which meant that each garment was essentially bespoke. It was meant to fit an individual woman and her individual measurements and represented um, a significant investment in labor and a significant display of skill. And the skills of sewing were those that um, almost without exception, all 19th century women had. Um, and this great quote from Eliza Farrar in her advice manual, The Young Lady's Friend said, a woman who does not know how to sew is as deficient in her education as a man who cannot write. Um, sewing was a skill expected of anyone, whether they were rich or poor, and um, education would have started while very young. And so the first thing that small children learned was what was called plain sewing. And these were things like um, straight sewing, seaming, hemming, making buttons. And uh, the point of this was to be useful to your mother who would be mending clothes and making household textiles. And from the time you were about four or five years old, a needle would be put in your hand and you would be helping out your mom. And so this wonderful thing here is a darning sampler. And uh, this dates to 1893. And what it is is a sampler from, made by a young girl who is learning her plain sewing stitches. So we've got examples of um, darning here. We've got examples where she um, did these little pleats. She attached ruffles at the bottom. She cross-stitched her name. Cross-stitching was often used to embroider household textiles to keep track of them in the laundry. She made a buttonhole. She made a little loop that could attach to a hook and eye. So um, this is, uh, you know, it's not like colorful or eye-catching, but this demonstrates her mastery of the plain sewing skills that she would have needed to um, help run a household. If you were a uh, girl of a little bit more means, you might be sent to a ladies' finishing school. And some of the things you learned there, um, in addition to plain sewing, were more fancy embroidery. So this is a sampler that belonged to a girl named Jessie Ann Spencer. She completed it in 1840 when she was 13 years old. And she was from Tazewell County, Illinois. And Illinois samplers are fairly rare. So this is kind of a special object here. And so um, she is demonstrating not only her handiwork here, but her mastery of the alphabet and her numbers. And she has a um, little um, poem here, a religious poem. So it's showing she has been taught reading, um, writing, arithmetic, uh, religious instruction, and fancy embroidery. And so these things were keepsakes. This represented an investment in your daughter that you spared her from your house's work and paid her tuition at her school, and she learned to create this beautiful thing. So often they would be displayed with pride in the family's home. So being um, fundamental to a uh, woman's labor, um, sewing in the 19th century was synonymous with work. So your sewing basket was your work basket. Your sewing table was your work table. And um, sewing was an everyday fact of a woman's life. Um, even if you were a well-off woman who had domestic servants in your home, uh, the domestic servants would be tasked with doing things like scrubbing the floors or cooking or washing or things that um, involve the heavy lifting and the kind of grimy labor that you were paying someone else to do. Your household mending is something that you could do sitting down and um, in a fairly relaxed manner, maybe while someone's reading aloud. Um, so women tended to uh, tackle their own sewing themselves, no matter what their financial situation. And so this here is an example of a lady's sewing box. And what's wonderful about this is that it came to us intact. So it's as though um, Anna de Groff of Kendall County kind of packed up her sewing supplies one day in 1888 and put her sewing box on the shelf. And then we discovered it um, more than 100 years later. So we see her thread and we see her pins. We've got a lump of chalk that was used to mark her um, garments for sewing. We've got a lump of wax that was used to um, wax her thread to make it smooth and strong. We've got hem clips. We've got her emery bag that would have kept her needle sharp. 
And even this wonderful poem um, that she had clipped probably from a local newspaper, and she kept it in her sewing box. And this suggests um, both how much she um, liked the poem to keep it near her and how much she sewed because this was probably something she looked at and wanted to be reminded of every single day when she opened her sewing box. So a woman in her household uh, would typically sew um, her own undergarments. She would probably sew most of her children's clothing. She would probably sew uh, many of her husband's shirts and she would do the household textiles like the sheets and pillowcases and towels. Um, anything more advanced than that, she might bring in a seamstress, and we'll talk about seamstresses and professional sewers in a bit, um, but generally all of a woman's household linens were sewn by hand. So we have this chemise on display here. Um, this is the foundational garment that was worn closest to the skin when getting dressed, and this was made by Helen Hume in 1871. So in terms of um, inspiration for fashion, um, people relied heavily on Godey's Ladies Book. And these ladies magazines had been printed since the early 19th century. And the heart of the fashion world was in Paris at the time. So generally, um, Paris was putting out fashion magazines. And then American publishers were getting a hold of the French fashions and literally copying them over into their own publications for sale in the United States. Um, so Godey's was just ripping off directly straight from Paris. And so these would come in the mail and it's not a whole lot different than your Vogue magazine of today. And these were meant as inspiration. Um, the fashion plates in here generally were a little bit more elaborate than your typical, you know, home sewer could be expected to uh, tackle on her own. But what you would do, you would flip through and you would see like, oh, I see that they're wearing, you know, trim on the bodice this year. or That's where they're placing their ribbons. And so you kind of get inspired. The fashion magazines would include written directions for sewing, but they did not include patterns initially. So um, you were meant to kind of take your existing garments and use them as a pattern to either create something new or rework them. But this was, yes, I'm sorry, do we have another question? I actually have three questions. Okay, three questions. Are those tidy cartridge pleats of the bodice on the chemise? Um, let me take a close look, see. They are right down here. There are tiny little cartridge pleats here and up here at the yoke too. Yes, good eye. And then when was the sewing machine invented? Ooh, good question. We will get there. We're, uh, we're gonna round the corner and talk about the sewing machine. And your last one, did they make their own lace at this period or purchase it? Do they make their own lace? And you know, I don't know enough about that to say. Um, I know that lace making was a cottage industry in New England going back to the 18th century and that women would make it in their own homes, but then they would also um, sell it or trade it for goods. So I think it was probably um, a mix. I think that there were some women who were skillful enough to make their own lace. Um, it was very time consuming. So I would imagine that um, a lot of women also chose to buy their trim as well. So um, jumping back into the production of clothing, um, Commercial dress patterns started to become available in the 1850s, um, but these earliest patterns did not come sized. So they were just meant to be um, cutting guides. 
but again, you are meant to um, kind of use one of your own deconstructed dresses to really be the pattern for the fit and to guide your fitting. Um, starting in the um, 1860s, we see the introduction of paper dress patterns that are sized, and by the 1880s, um, they're kind of widely available on the market. They're being mass produced, as well as these um, drafting systems that sort of help the home sewer calculate measurements for their own sewing. Um, so again, this was a way that fashion became kind of democratized because now anyone with sewing skills had access to, you know, the latest French fashions that were broken down into patterns that really anyone could work with. And this was accomplished with varying degrees of skill. And one thing we're showing in the exhibit is this bodice here. And if you look very closely at it, um, she spaced her buttons a little funny. She was going kind of wide here. And then by the time she got to the bottom, she kind of ran out of room. So this woman we're speculating was kind of um, likely a home sewer who might well have been using a commercial pattern. And um, she did a, um, by my standards, very skillful job of constructing a bodice, but not like Perfect, you know, she wasn't a professional dressmaker. She still had her little hoops here. So now as we're rounding the corner, um, let's talk about the sewing machine. So, uh, yes. I'm gonna keep the motions because I can't hear you. Yes. Uh, that the question is, what is the name of the book that stated that sewing was necessary for young girls? And the title of it is The Young Lady's Friend, and the author was Eliza Farrar. How do you make lace? So um, this involves, I know it involves bobbins, and it's basically taking thread and sort of winding it in an intricate pattern and um, you can tat lace. You can you also can crochet lace. Tat lace and you can crochet lace, but I don't know much about lace making, so that's something we'll have to investigate further. Um, so back to the sewing machine. Um, the sewing machine was um, invented in the 1840s. Isaac Singer achieved his patent in the 1850s. But the early machines um, were very heavy. They were um, kind of clunky. They each had individual parts. So if it broke down, um, you were kind of out of luck in terms of repair. It would kind of require an individualized fix. And um, they were also very expensive. So for the first 20 or so years of the sewing machine's life, you would be most likely to find it um, in a garment factory. Um, there were merchant tailors who were um, starting to mass produce men's clothing, and they would typically buy one or more of these machines and train their apprentices to use them, and so use them in a centralized space. The home sewing machine came about um, and really gained popularity after the Civil War and about the 1870s is when it really penetrated the middle class market. So most women had or had the ability to have a sewing machine by the 1870s. And this was achieved because they got smaller, they got lighter, there was um, interchangeable parts which made them easier to repair. There were marketing plans where you could pay in installments. Um, so this kind of put the sewing machine into the American woman's home. And of course this was touted as a huge labor-saving device, which in many cases it was um, because a shirt that took you 14 hours to sew, you could now crank out in an hour and a half. However, um, as Sewing got faster, the standards of fashion were raised. So um, fashion got fussier, they added more bows and ruches and ruffles to things. So the time that you wound up saving on your sewing machine was often eaten up by the um, elaborateness of the fashion. In terms of uh, commercial sewing, so there was um, many an enterprising housewife who had a sewing machine and used it to kind of jumpstart her own business and who had taken sewing or create things for her neighbors and so added to the household income with it. Um, also, same with um, seamstresses and dressmakers um, who definitely used the machine to their advantage. The flip side of this was that um, 
in the um, garment industry, um, it had previously relied on hand sewers, and many of these women were put out of work because the sewing machine meant that a uh, work could be done best and cheap, and they did not have access to a machine themselves, um, and so further drove down wages and put them out of work altogether. So, um, sewing machine blessing or curse is the title of this exhibit here. The sewing machine we have on display um, was owned by um, the same um, woman whose sewing box it was actually uh, from Kendall County. And this is an 1870s model. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, women who made their lives through their needlework. Um, there were dressmakers and there were seamstresses. And dressmakers were at the top of that, that particular hierarchy. A dressmaker was considered a um, skilled craftsperson and they designed dresses, they measured it, they cut it, they basted it, sewed it, trimmed it, and um, had the skill to basically, when you have your Godey's magazine and you say, I want that, then your dressmaker was um, the one who could bring that into fruition for you. And so um, dressmaking in an era where there wasn't a whole lot of professional opportunities open to women, a dressmaker was pr pretty much the top of the pyramid in terms of a woman's ability to make her own wages, um, be her own boss, set her own schedule. Um, often women hired apprentices who worked under her. Dressmakers could have their own shops that a lady would visit in town, or they might go from house to house and be put up for um, a few days to a few weeks at a time and do the family sewing. If they went that route, then they were um, given rooms like guest rooms, not servants' rooms, and they were called by Miss or Mrs. rather than their first names, which was kind of a way to sort of um, talk down to other household help. So it was definitely a high status profession and it was a way for um, women who were talented uh, needle women to um, support themselves and avoid factory work, avoid domestic servant, avoid um, more kind of uh, labor intensive work. Or it was a way for um, women to uh, avoid marriage. If they wanted an independent life um, and not relying on a husband for support, then they could strike out on their own and become dressmakers. So the dress that we have here um, was created for a woman named Bridget Fullerty of Tazewell County. And this was her wedding dress. And we know that she hired a woman named Miss Graham. Unfortunately, she didn't tell us Miss Graham's first name, so we weren't able to track her down or learn anything more about Miss Graham. But uh, Bridget Fogarty um, was a woman of moderate means, and so the likely scenario is that Bridget um, herself was a seamstress who probably made her own personal linens and her own household textiles. Um, she probably brought in a professional seamstress because she wanted a um, fancy and elaborate dress for her wedding, which is kind of the relationship that a lot of women had with dress dressmakers. Um, a lot of women did their own work and brought in dressmakers for more complicated things or sometimes um, a woman would actually work with the dressmaker like she would cut the fabric and the dressmaker would fit it and sew it or uh, a woman might even base fabric together in advance of the dressmaker and then the dressmaker would achieve the precise fit. And so the last thing we're going to talk about today is um, seamstresses. And seamstresses um, were considered unskilled labor. So uh, the vast majority of women who made their living through their needlework in the 19th century were seamstresses. And um, it was not an easy life. Um, a lot of women worked on what was called the putting out system. So we have the rise of the garment industry in the early 19th century. And this is actually um, a uh, kind of collateral um, result of the rise of the cotton industry because you have um, all this cotton being produced. You have New England textile factories who are cranking out cotton fabric and cotton fabric in itself only has so much potential as a commodity. You know, how many yards of cotton does someone need? So they needed to turn that cotton into another commodity to keep 
profits going. And so the enterprising merchant tailors began mass producing and started with men's shirts and men's pants. And by the later 19th century, moved into women's um, wear. So in those early days, pre-Civil um, pre War with men's clothing, you would, if you were a seamstress, you would pick up bundles of pre-cut fabric from this merchant tailor and you would take it to your own home. And this was an attractive profession for um, widows or wives who had been abandoned, who had small children and dependents at home and needed a flexible way to earn a living where she could also mind her own children. And she was paid um, miserably because, as we talked about, all women were expected to know how to sew. So her skills were um, not valued as skilled. She was considered unskilled because everyone knows how to hem and everyone knows how to make a buttonhole. So this woman would have to travel around town, pick up her bundles of fabric, travel to her home. So she ate the cost of her fuel and food and fire and rent um, and then went back to uh, the tailor and drop them off for her pay. And there were many more seamstresses than um, there were uh, demand for them. So wages were kept low and women were, were not paid terribly well. Yes, another question. The year of this wedding dress? This was sewn in 1876. So this is right in the middle of the bustle era. Okay, so we talked about the um, putting out system where you would pick up bundles of fabric and sew it in your home. Um, after uh, the middle of the 19th century, there was also the um, in system or the, or the kind of factory system. And this would occur when um, clothing manufacturers would essentially buy up lots of machines and bring women into a centralized location to sew on them. Um, and this kind of gave rise to the um, sweatshop. And so here's an image of a shirtwaist factory. So we've got all these women under one roof um, and the conditions are not great and the pay is not great. If you've heard of the triangle shirtwaist fire, um, that's kind of the, the example of unsafe labor conditions and sort of the disregard for labor and life. So this um, shirtwaist blouse here is of the type that might have been made um, by a sweatshop worker. So um, in the one sense, a shirtwaist is a um, symbol of a woman who is earning her own uh, salary, who's working in a factory, working outside the home and achieving a degree of independence. It is also on the flip side, a symbol of um, the exploitation of women's labor that went into the creation of mass produced clothing. So this is where we end. Um, I, we do have uh, the video up and running. So now we're going to take you behind the scenes into our collection center, where I will walk you through our storage area and talk to you a little bit about some of the um, textile and clothing making tools that we have in storage there. Um, when we get to the sewing machine part, you will see right away that I am not a sewer and don't know my way around a sewing machine. So I hope you will, um, there with me and you know cut me a little slack there. <laughs> Good thing Elizabeth was there and she does know her way around the sewing machine. Um, so we will play that video for you and then we'll reconvene here and we'll see if there are any final questions. Welcome to the Illinois State Museum's Research and Collection Center. This is our off-site storage facility on Ash Street uh, where the museum stores uh, the vast majority of their collections that we don't have room to store in the downtown museum facility. So today I'll be taking you through um, a couple of items that have to do with early textile and clothing production in Illinois. So over here on this range is where we store our spinning wheels. And I think there's a law out there somewhere that to be a real museum, you have to have a minimum of two spinning wheels in your collection. So this is where we fulfill that requirement. I'm just kidding, that's not really a thing, but um, it seems like spinning wheels are something that um, always wind up in museums. 
and we've got some wonderful ones. Um, and this reflects the fact that textile production was an important part of um, early Illinois life. It was a skill that um, most rural women would have been familiar with. Um, if you were living in the cities, you were probably purchasing your cloth at a local store, and that cloth was um, more than likely either being imported from a New England factory or from an English factory. However, if you lived on a farm in early Illinois, which the vast majority of people did, um, then making your own flax and uh, linen and spinning your own wool was a common activity. And so the great wheel here um, is an object that would have been used primarily for uh, spinning wool. And it's also sometimes known as a walking wheel because the process of spinning, which um, full disclosure, I've never done myself, so I'm just telling you what I've read, not what I've experienced, but the process involves walking back and forth, back and forth to spin the wool fibers into thread. And we have some wonderful early examples of great wheels. Um, this one is thought to date to about the 1820s. And the original owner of this was uh, Mary Holt Bond. And she was married to a man named James Bond, although we call him James B. Bond. And James Bond um, was a soldier who was killed in the Black Hawk War in 1832. And he was also a son of the Illinois governor Shadrach Bond. And so uh, we know this belonged to Mary when she was married to James. After James's death in 1832, Mary remarried and um, presumably took the wheel with her because she passed it to her son who passed it down through many generations until it finally made its home uh, here in Illinois. So this is a great example of um, really early history of our state. Um, if you want to come around with me to the other side, we have some other examples of early textile tools. And along the way, you'll get a little sneak peek of just the wide array of things here. This is where we store our furniture, our decorative arts, our textiles. So um, there's a little bit of everything going on. And we have another uh, great wheel here. And this belonged to a woman named um, Christiana Stolte. And she was a German immigrant. She came from Germany to the United States around 1845. Her first stop was in Pennsylvania, and then she and her husband moved to Champaign County. And so um, it's thought that this wheel um, might have been brought, disassembled and brought with them from Pennsylvania to Champaign County. And they got here in 1856, and that was kind of the tail end of home uh, textile production. After the Civil War, it would become much more common for um, people of all um, geographic locations and socioeconomic levels. They were, um, they were consumers of cloth rather than producers. And then just one more I wanted to point out is up here. And this is a little flax wheel. So a flax wheel is used for spinning flax into linen. And we have a great video that we filmed out at New Salem that will illustrate that topic a little further. But this one belonged to a woman named um, Mary Madden. And her husband Mark was a cabinet maker and so he likely built that wheel specifically for her and the Maddens or the Martins I'm sorry were early settlers of Brown County and they arrived around the year 1837 so this wheel probably dates to um, shortly after they arrived So if we think about women and their um, cloth and clothes making skills in the 19th century, women at the very beginning of the 1800s would have had the skills to both um, produce cloth and produce clothing, especially if they live in rural areas. As we've talked about, um, as we move forward in the century um, and the Industrial Revolution gets underway in Illinois, it becomes much 
cheaper and more efficient to purchase your cloth. Um, to spin linen from flax could take a year and a half. Um, to spin wool into cloth, um, they say it takes from sheep to shirt, could take as long as a year. And so as that factory produced cloth becomes less expensive, um, it just makes more sense from a cost benefit analysis to invest your time into earning the money to buy the cloth rather than to put a year into making your cloth. So those textile uh, production skills fall away for women, but the sewing and the making clothing skills um, are something that goes strong um, for most if not all women throughout the entire 19th century and well into the 20th century. And after the Civil War, the sewing machine becomes more affordable. Um, and we'll probably talk a little bit about this in the exhibit as well. But by the 1870s and 80s, they become a fixture in most middle class homes. And this is an example that dates probably from around the 1890s. And this belonged to a woman, and I want to make sure I get her name right, named Mary DeGroff J and they uh, had a farm in Kendall County. The farm actually stayed in the family's possession from the 1850s all the way into the 21st century, and a lot of the original artifacts stayed with it and made its way to us. So this is a sewing machine that Mary would have acquired in the 1890s. It's a treadle model. It's missing its band, but it would have been powered um, entirely by foot power. You could step on it and make it go, and this would have saved um, Mary a lot of time on her straight sewing, um, but as we've mentioned before, uh, fashion at the time compensated by becoming a little bit more frilly and involved, so she would have lost time um, with the expectation that she needed to wear these embellished clothes and more complicated clothes than was um, in style before. And so what's neat about this collection is that um, the family did keep all their artifacts together. So in addition to Mary's 1890s sewing machine, we also have her daughter-in-law, Addie Foster J's sewing machine that she purchased in 1916. And this one is great because it's made by the Free Sewing Machine Company of Rockford, Illinois and the original paint is still strong on it. You can see it's got a painted on ruler here where she could make her measurements and the manufacturer's notes about the size of needle needed and the number of cotton skeins, all that's intact here. And I always like to poke through the drawers just to see if anyone left anything behind. And oh, there's our cord that uh, makes the sewing machine run. Looks like it's leather. Huh. And then it looks like there's some spools of thread left over. Bobbins. Probably. Bobbins. Full disclosure, I don't sew in a machine either. <laughs> but Elizabeth, our educator, does. So she's a pinch hitting and filling in this knowledge that I don't have. So nothing in those drawers. I um, just wanted to point out one more machine here. And this belonged to a woman named Rose uh, Kent Myers of um, DeWitt County. And I know for a fact, because I've rifled through these drawers before, that Rose did leave her things behind, which I think is just wonderful. We can see all her thread. She's got a measuring tape. Ooh, oil can to keep her machine oiled. These things look like egg beaters. What are these? It's a screwdriver. Huh! Oh, cool. Oh, she's got all the toys. Ooh, neat. Directions for using steel attachments. So she's got her uh, instruction manuals and her certificate of warranty. My husband would approve. He always saves the warranties and instruction manuals. I always throw them away and hope for the best. 
So the last thing I want to share with you um, is the contents of an Illinois family's uh, sewing basket that came to us just within the past couple of years. And so this is a nice little window on what a woman would have been working on uh, at the turn of the 20th century. Okay, and the last collection I'm going to show you came to us from the descendants of the Ozias M. Hatch family. Uh, Hatch was the Secretary of the State of Illinois and a great friend of Abraham Lincoln in the mid-19th century and the wonderful thing about the hatches is that they never threw anything away. They kept things intact and so when they donated to the museum it was literally like a time capsule of the 19th century. So when we open this box we're seeing the contents of a hatch woman, probably um, Isabel Hatch's sewing box and it's like we're peering into it as she set it down in the year 1904, which is just wonderful because typically these kinds of ephemeral things just disappear over the years and we don't get to see the real experience and the real assemblage of what women were working with on an everyday basis. But not here. Now we're going to see exactly what Isabel was working on. And so basically we have um, just odds and ends from her sewing box. And this is the start of a baby dress that she has roughed out here. It's very soft linen. And Isabel had a young son who was born, I believe, around the year 1904. So this might have been something she was working on for him and for whatever reason didn't finish. So in this art incarnation, she's just kind of got it roughed out with linen. Um, she's got a second version here. Um, where she has sewn in some lace and again if you'll remember from the last talk um, boys and girls were dressed similarly until they were about three to seven years old um, so any infant would have just been in a white dress um, until they were at least around three years old then we have a pair of sleeves here that might well be for this garment it might have been from a different one but we can imagine that uh, Isabel just had all her odds and ends here, and um, for whatever reason, the baby dress didn't get completed, and um, I can't imagine that there's any home sewers watching right now who have ever not finished a project or <laughs> put something on hold, so we can probably all relate. And again, um, pieces of linen fabric here that might have been parts of a garment, or they might have been patterns for a garment, but just as Isabel kept them. And then we have her odds and ends, her scraps of lace, her scraps of crochet work, her um, bands of edging and tacking here. Wrapped around pieces of car, I mean, this is wonderful too. Um, it's small detail, but it, makes me uh, nerd out a little bit. Um, I've seen this elsewhere in her collection. This is a piece of a shoebox. So she has taken a piece of a shoebox and just kind of um, wrapped her uh, trim around it, which, you know, we wouldn't have known if she hadn't saved it exactly as she was using it. It's got her laces. It's got more fabric still tied up with the scrap of fabric that she left it. So um, any historians of sewing and textiles and fabrics um, can really get a wonderful glimpse into what a woman was working with around the year 1900. And so uh, with that, we will go back um, live and continue with the talk in the gallery. So thank you so much for joining us. So uh, I want to wrap up the evening by taking any more questions that people have. Um, again, with the caveat that um, I'm not this mistress myself, so my knowledge is more academic than practical, um, and it's sort of a mile wide and an inch deep, so I hope you'll bear with me, and I will tell you what I know and admit when I don't. So, uh, do you have any more questions? Okay. Were the services that you were defined in the area, or were the services why? Um, so does that mean, does anyone in the country have access to a dressmaker? Um, 
Essentially, um, I would imagine if you were, you know, far flung on the Nebraska frontier, you might have harder time getting a hold of a dressmaker. Um, but certainly in urban areas, there were many dressmakers to choose from. Um, in smaller towns, there was usually, if not an official dressmaker who um, put out her shingle and located in town. Then there were the women who did the traveling thing and would go from um, place to place. So. Um, Typically, yes, if you um, were anywhere near any kind of urban area, you probably had the option to hire a dressmaker. Okay, is the collection uh, available for viewing? Also, do you need any assistance? Do I need, okay, is the collection available for viewing and do I need any assistance? Um, our collection is available to um, researchers who want to study it. Um, an appointment can be made to view the collection. Um, do I need any assistance? That's a complicated answer. Um, the short answer is yes, but the complicating factor is COVID. Um, in the pandemic era, um, having volunteers work is um, still not something that has come back online yet. So um, post COVID, yes, absolutely, I will need assistance. And um, if anyone would like to email me to get in touch, my email is erika.holst at illinois.gov. Um, and I will keep your name on file for the happy day when we can have volunteers again. Okay, we want to know about the blue dress in the background details. The blue dress, is it this one right here? We had a question about the blue dress in the background. We're going to roll the camera around for confirmation. Is this the dress here? Behind us the other way. Oh, the uh, other dress there. Okay. Um, that is a uh, afternoon dress or a dinner dress that dates to around 1860 and we have it on exhibit as an example of a young woman's garment. Um, the wide neckline and the vibrant color indicate that this is probably worn by a young unmarried woman. This is something that came to us from the um, Illinois State University's costume collection. And unfortunately, a lot of garments that were transferred to us from them uh, did not come with provenance. They were used mainly as um, examples for their construction and less for their personal history. So we can't tell who wore it or um, under what circumstances. Um, all we know is sort of what the garment itself tells us. Okay, next question. Did a dressmaker have status in the community? I'm assuming she was single? Uh, did a dressmaker have status in the community and um, they assumed she was single? And the answer is um, yes, she did have status. Um, she uh, was considered a um, respected independent professional. Um, they were, um, usually single. I imagine there were some that were probably married, especially if they were in big urban areas where they kept a shop and could return home. But typically there was sort of an itinerant component, component that didn't work well with dependents. So yes, typically single women and um, they were, um, a good one would be in demand. Um, so, you know, you would wait for the time when she had an opening in her uh, calendar and you would brag to your friends that you had a dress by Mrs. So-and-so. And so yes, it was considered a high status occupation. Probably the high st highest status occupation that a woman could hold. I have heard the term twice turned skirt. What does it mean? Okay, so the uh, question is, what does the term twice turned skirt mean? So all that labor that went into clothing um, was something that women were keenly aware of, whether they sewed it themselves or whether they hired a dressmaker, they knew exactly how much labor and cost was involved in it. So unlike today, when you know we get a small hole in our garments and decide we're done with them and throw them out or donate them, um, women 
wrung every bit of wear that you could out of a garment. So um, if your skirt got worn out, you might literally um, cut it apart. And especially if it's a small print that works either up or down, you might turn it around and reorient it so the worn places are um, being covered up or cut out and reformed. Um, and so basically it's an expression that refers to the way that people remade their garments and reworked them to get as much life out of the textile as possible. They would like to see the portrait right here on the wall okay. and also know more about the First Lady's dress. Okay, so we had a question about seeing the portrait here on the wall. And so this is a portrait by uh, George Peter Alexander Healy. And she was painted um, probably in the mid 1870s. We don't know the identity of the woman. And if you want a full confession, we put her up because we had to uh, reorient the exhibit post COVID where all our interactive components were taken out. And this left a void in the wall here. And we thought that a nice, large, lovely painting would be a great way to fill it, especially since she's wearing this remarkable dress of lace. Um, but we were also cognizant of the fact that um, while women like her and beautiful garments like hers are often the ones that wind up on display in museums, um, there's an entire story and um, set of experiences that's not being conveyed um, overtly, and that is the stories of the people who are um, harvesting the raw materials for the fabrics and creating the garment. So our interpretive label over here invites you to ask uh, whose clothing and whose stories do you see? Um, because typically it's the clothing of the um, middle class and affluent women that um, is saved and passed on to children and finds its way to museums. The people who made the clothing, um, the nicer examples, are less likely to have their own clothing preserved and um, saved and exhibited. Um, and so so we want to draw attention to the fact that for every beautiful gown like that on display, there are people behind it who have um, harvested the materials, who have done the sewing, who have done the mending and done the work that made it possible. And we did have a question about the first lady's dress here. So we will flip the camera around again. And so um, we were fortunate enough that um, the First Lady of Illinois um, agreed to select a garment for exhibit. Um, she chose this from our collection as her choice to display. And she uh, said she chose it because she loves the vibrant blue color and the bustle. Um, First Lady Pritzker said this looks like it would be fun to wear. And this dates to the mid 1800s and it was worn by a woman named Percy Carpenter Grout of Scott County, Illinois. And so this is a time when um, fashion is becoming more democratic through the use of those mass produced commercial patterns and the availability of the home sewing machine. And so um, this may well be something that Percy um, made herself. Okay, did the dressmakers get their own fabric or did someone provide it for them? How did people get fabric in the 1860s and 70s? Um, did dressmakers provide the fabric or did someone give it to them? Um, I think in most cases, women purchased their fabric and handed it to the dressmaker. And um, again, we have this um, network of trade that's solidly in place um, in the United States by the 19th century. Um, even say here in Springfield, which was established in 1823, and the earliest stores here in Springfield are carrying um, fabric for purchase. So um, this is kind of a way a woman expressed her individuality was by selecting fabrics. Um, the bigger the urban center, the wider the array that you had. Um, but it was known as dress goods when you purchased a bundle of fabric. I imagine that in um, urban centers like New York and Philadelphia, where um, there are really established dressmaking shops, that you probably had the option to buy fabric there and that the um, dressmaker had kind of expanded her business to include, um, you know, hats and fabric and trim and it was kind of one stop shopping. But I think for the average person in kind of your um, small to medium sized town, you would buy the fabric and then um, bring in the dressmaker just to fashion it for you. Okay, so we have one more. 
Um, can you tell us more about the remade garments behind you? And I think they're talking about those over there. The weaving garments? Remade. Remade garments. Um, I can, but that's going to be the October talk. So I would encourage you to tune back in, oh, I'm sorry, November. So I would encourage you to tune in in November and we will go into depth on the idea of um, mending and remaking and washing and recycling clothes. So one last question then. Yes. How many yards of fabric would it take to make a dress like the first lady's choice? Oh boy. Um, I would say I know that the um, hoop skirt type sometimes took eight to 10 yards. And I would guess that it's not much less than that. Um, it's more streamlined, but she does have a lot of fabric bunched up in the back. And I'm gonna throw that to Elizabeth who does so. Elizabeth doesn't know. So we're gonna say maybe as many as eight yards. 